Sam, uh, um, taught economics here from the mid 60s to the early 70s, is now uh, heading uh, the economics program at the Santa Fe Institute and teaches at the University of Siena and is emeritus at UMass Amherst. Um, and it's one of the reasons that he's my intellectual hero is because it seems like every 10 years he learns an entirely new suite of <laughs> techniques and abilities to look at the world and set up subjects. And so uh, one reason that he's uh, fascinating to us here is that he's spent the last um, um, more than a decade now working on cooperation, the evolution of cooperation, modeling, uh, uh, agent-based modeling and simulation, and later on now. Yesterday we heard him give a talk, talk at the program of evolution dynamics on uh, uh, genetics uh, uh, evidence and archaeological evidence of evolution of cooperation through warfare. Uh, so and he publishes in all of uh, the top scientific journals uh, how many people do you have who publish in science and nature and philosophy and public affairs in the American Economic Review, etc. So it's a true, true pleasure uh, to have you here. Thank you all very much for coming and your interest in my work. Uh, I can truly say that having uh, heard what you're all doing, that uh, you all collectively and I think probably also individually know a lot more about uh, what I will be soon talking about than I do. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I was overjoyed when Yochai uh, asked me would I come. I, uh, this is a project which has uh, uh, both uh, been on, on my stove cooking slowly for a long time, but it's also, it will remain there for a long time. It's, uh, it's, it's a work which I hope to finish over a good number of years. Uh, the, uh, uh, because I know some people have to leave early, I have to tell you what the basic idea is first. Um, and I want to look at the, um, the way institutions are likely to evolve. Uh, in uh, what is sometimes called the weightless economy. The weightless economy is what all of you study. That is the economy that can't be weighed or fenced or for that matter probably contracted for very conveniently. Um, in an economy such as a knowledge-based economy, but what's important here, not exclusively just that one, if it's based on embodied or relational wealth, networks or knowledge or somatic uh, wealth, individual possession-based property rights are both difficult to enforce and socially harmful when they are enforced. Uh, so that um, uh, once you have an econ if you ever have an economy, if we do have one, I will assert that we've had one certainly in the past, uh, in which the main wealth is of this nature, then the logic of uh, Adam Smith's invisible hand uh, fails. And it fails not in a small way, the way welfare economics has documented over the years, the past hundred years or so, uh, but it fails in a rather major way. Uh, the, um, uh, I don't think that, maybe that's stated more strongly than some of you would agree with, but it's not a new idea. The second one is uh, perhaps a new idea, and that is that uh, we can get some insights about how a society in which the main skills are relate, the main wealth is uh, relational and somatic, uh, what I've called the weightless economy, by studying the late Pleistocene forager economy, in which the stuff that life depended on couldn't be owned and wasn't owned. Uh, now, in contrast to the societies which followed that, in which things like land and cattle and so on were possible uh, to own. In order to study this transitional process uh, from an economy based on material things to an economy based on immaterial things, it occurred to me a year ago that why don't I just run backwards, literally uh, run backwards a model of the, the Holocene uh, uh, revolution in property rights associated with the demise of hunting and gathering and the emergence of a new kind of economy based on material wealth. Just take that transition and do it backwards, literally. I'll do that today if we have time. I mean, I'll, I'll do in real time a simulation uh, of that process uh, running in reverse. Uh, <clears throat> it may be true also, though surprising, that the forager economy, about which we know a fair amount now, uh, from ethnographic work and others, the forager economy may be some kind of a model for some aspects of the weightless economy of the future. Now, this will probably uh, excite in some of you uh, some notions of the Flintstone economy or something like that, uh, but I think it's actually quite a serious proposition, and I think we can do modeling our interactions after the forager model much better than they, given the modern communications techniques uh, at our disposal. Don't be worried. The rest of the talk will not be entirely like this, but I do have to explain a few techniques that I'm going to use. Uh, we'll start over here. 
this is the wealth of a person. Uh, the wealth is made up of network wealth, embodied wealth, and material wealth. Uh, gamma is just some positive constant. And the exponents are the importance of this wealth. So n is raised to alpha, which is some number less than 1. Uh, and beta is the importance of embodied wealth. And material wealth is raised to the power 1 minus alpha minus beta. All that means is that if you double all the kinds of wealth that you have, you'll double your wealth. Uh, you'll, the economists here will recognize this as a so-called Cobb-Douglas production function. This simplex here is a device I'm going to use to represent a technology of a society. Uh, this point D here, uh, the coordinates of this uh, add to 1. This distance here, alpha, is how important network wel wealth is. So if a society were characterized by a point there, it would be a society in which the only kind of wealth was network wealth. Uh, and similarly, embodied wealth uh, being the only kind there and material wealth here. Uh, and we're going to talk about how through the great course of prehistory and history and the future, societies may have moved from various points here and what that might tell us about the nature of property rights that would be essential for the governing of the society. What I have here is based on an empirical study, which I had done uh, with a very large team, 26 uh, members of this research team. We just published a paper in science. I think we had 26 authors on this and a forthcoming compendium in, uh, in uh, current anthropology. This is the same simplex, obviously. And over here, you have the societies which are hunter-gatherer or horticultural. Horticultural meaning they use domesticated plants and animals, mostly plants, but they don't use uh, draft animals, plows, and so on. And over here, you have agricultural and pastoral societies. So you can see here in history, in prehistory, we did have a shift from a set of, uh, uh, take the hunter-gatherers, that's the Pleistocene, probably 150,000 years, of economies more or less over here in which all the wealth to speak of was embodied or network. And then a quite radical shift down here taking place maybe 8,000 years ago when we domesticated plants and animals and turned the wealth into something which could actually be owned, uh, tethered outside your house, fenced and exchanged and so on uh, here. You may wonder how we got this. Uh, these are based on ethno ethnographer's accounts of these societies. Each one of these uh, triangles and squares is a particular society, uh, which we have studied uh, through field work. The large triangles are the average. So that's the average of the hunter-gatherers. And these two are the averages of the uh, pastoral and agricultural. Did you say how you define each kind of wealth? What? How you define each kind of wealth again? Uh, I didn't. Okay. You're very nice. He didn't. Yeah. He said again, but in fact, I forgot to do it. Thank you. <laughs> this is a very nice crowd. Uh, <laughs> network wealth is the uh, contribution made by your social connections to uh, your uh, well being. This is just a measure of well being, right? So it's the extent to which connections matter. Now, of course, you say, well, how do I measure that? Well, I could measure it by the number of connections you have, I could measure it by a measure of centrality in a network, like betweenness or something else. Uh, in, in, this, in this study, actually, because we don't have complete network data for most of the societies, we measure it just by the number of connections. The number of people will help, who will help you in your fields, the number of people with whom you share food, and so on. Embodied wealth is a combination of things like what's in your head and also your strength. Uh, you, well, you may say, well, those are really quite different. That's right, but it's very hard to draw this thing in four dimensions on the blackboard. Uh, and uh, so we combine things like grip strength, and uh, hunting ability. Hunting ability is a good, good example, because that is both somatic in the sense of strength, but it's also incredibly intellect intensive. I mean, the hunters are extremely, <laughs> hunting is an extremely cognitively demanding uh, way to make a living. Uh, so this is, um, uh, and of course, just, I mean, in, in case you wondered, I'm going to suggest that we were here until about 8,000 years ago. We moved here uh, just for a few moments, maybe eight or 10,000 years, and we're now moving back here. Uh, that's the storyline. Uh, and I'll try to simulate that process and see what that might have to do with the property rights that might be appropriate for this kind of movement from here to here and then back. Um, uh, all right. Now, <clears throat> um, I'm going to start with the invisible hand. This will be uh, Economics 101 to most of you. The basic idea of the invisible hand theorem, proved by Arrow and Debra, is that good fences make good neighbors. You know, once a New Englander, you never forget Robert Frost. And uh, so I translated the fundamental theorem of welfare economics into his poem. 
uh, which, by the way, the point of which was not that good fences make good neighbors. Uh, uh, but yeah, that doesn't like a wall. Uh, that's the main point of this talk, by the way. I, I'll, qu I'll quote the whole poem at the end if you'd like, because uh, that is the point. Now, what Arrow and Dubrow showed is that spe the speculation of Smith that uh, essentially the invisible hand would work for the uh, good of society, harnessing self-interest, uh, this kind of uh, economic alchemy whereby ordinary motives are converted into valuable social outcomes. Uh, the, um, uh, it requires that we have complete markets, which means that everything that passes between individuals are governed by a complete, meaning covering everything, and enforceable contract. By enforceable, it means the cost to the exchanging parties is zero, and it's enforced by somebody else. It doesn't mean it's costless to the enforcer. That's the specialized agency of the state, the courts, and so on, obviously. This is a, I mean, maybe you call it something different. This is classical contract, or I, I forget what you call it. But no, this, is, this precludes things like, don't you call it private ordering? Uh, this basically says you have a very uh, essentially uh, abstract view of what a contract is, and it enforces itself somehow, or the cops enforce it. You don't have to ask about that. Increasing returns to scale have to be absent or small, and that's because if not, you won't be able to sustain uh, competition. Uh, this is also true for the second part of the theorem, but uh, for the part of the theorem that matters, namely optimality of a competitive equilibrium, this is important because it's important for the maintenance of competition. Now, under these conditions, you get uh, a rather remarkable result that goods will exchange so that the price of a good is equal to its marginal cost, and that marginal cost, because of the complete contracts, will be equal to the real cost, that is the real scarcity of the good, the so-called social marginal cost. And that's basically the take home of this. That in, and the reason why that very elementary point is playing a large role in the slide here is because I'm going to show and argue that in the weightless economy, that has to be not a little bit false, but massively false. Uh, and so the violation of this, the necessary violation of this in a private economy uh, will then, I think, be a major lever for institutional change in the future. Um, now, of course, this theorem has been subjected to a certain amount of doubting uh, by critics of a market-based and private property-based economy. But I would say that, in fact, uh, that's uh, one of my heroes, Ken Arrow, uh, the, um, uh, that model, the, the, the model which is underneath the invisible hand, worked pretty well for what I call the economy of grain and steel. It worked well because almost all inputs, oops, uh, all inputs and outputs uh, could be actually contracted for. There. Um, most of what went in, except for labor itself, uh, and most of what came out, you could measure and fence. Uh, these are uh, quantities which could be uh, contracted for because of that. You, you knew if it wasn't delivered and you knew if somebody stole it. Uh, now, and uh, so there are just lots of examples of um, uh, the, the economy which fits this invisible uh, hand theorem. Now, they tend to be a little exotic uh, because we don't have whole parts of the economy today in which the assumptions work. In fact, when I wrote an introductory economics text, I've had grave difficulty finding examples which actually corresponded to Adam Smith's theorem, uh, which I enthusiastically wanted to teach uh, my students. But there are some examples. He, the wonderful th these things are obviously homogeneous goods. They're easily measurable. The coffee cans are a sufficient measure. So these are examples of things which correspond to the theorem uh, itself. Now, uh, for most goods, in this economy of grain and steel of the past, uh, you had enough competing firms or, compet or potential competitors so that you had high levels of competition, assumed by the invisible hand theorem, uh, and so that while the economy didn't really approximate the theorem very closely, it approximated it much more closely than what was to come. And so we turn to the uh, weightless economy. Oh, you wondered about kudu, kudunomics. Just remember where you heard it first, by the way. Uh, that's a kudu. Uh, I'll tell you a little more about kudus uh, uh, in a minute. Well, the, the, the big fact about the weightless economy is that you have very high first copy costs, as they're, are, as they're called, and low or zero marginal costs. Uh, that means the cost of producing the book in the first place is high, or the CD, and so on. And there are just lots of examples. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Uh, the marginal cost of the CD is probably less than a dollar, certainly less than a dollar. 
uh, they sell for $20. What's the rest of it for? It's for the first copy cost. The music industry is not notably profitable, so it's not excess profits. It's just paying for the first copy cost. And the same is true of lots of things. Uh, the, uh, if you think of Windows uh, 97, uh, I mean, I, I don't know where this figure really, how, how we know this, $50 million, a second copy cost $3 or zero, depending on how you acquired it. Uh, and uh, if you look at pharmaceuticals, you get the same result. Now, uh, these are big, big differences uh, between the marginal cost and the price. The take-home message here is the marginal cost may be one-tenth of the price. Not that, you know, when people worry about, okay, the, the price of your gasoline in your car should be a little higher because it should take account of the envir environmental damage that running your car does. Well, it should be a little higher by what, 25% maybe or something like that. I mean, people got numbers like, this is, a, this is an order of magnitude off. This is, uh, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't worry about the price of gas, but here we have a situation in which Obviously, a company that charges prices equal to marginal cost will go out of business instantly. Uh, so just the, implementing what the fundamental theorem requires is impossible. Uh, then you have this uh, problem here, that is the copying costs are low. Now remember, that's the marginal cost point. Enforcing property rights is difficult, but even more so if it's successful, it's irrational because this enforcement of the property right is why you get to charge a price which exceeds the marginal cost. And that's exactly what you shouldn't be doing according to the fundamental theorem of welfare economics. So essentially, intellectual property rights, sort of paradoxically, are a way of forcing a violation of the invisible hand theorem. Uh, you force it because essentially you allow somebody to charge 20 bucks for a CD whose marginal cost is 85 cents. Uh, now, um, the, uh, there are lots of examples uh, of um, uh, economies of scale, remember, so I, th that's contracts, now we're going to go to economies of scale. Think about network externalities. Uh, network externalities are economies of scale on the side of demand. Well, they're legion. You think about faxes or learning languages or anything of that kind, there's just huge economies of scale and necessarily then a winner take all dynamic to the process of competition. Uh, the, um, no, I'm not going to do this network stuff. Uh, so market structure in, the econo in this economy of grain and steel, it exhibited, notice past tense, but I think that's maybe a little dramatic, uh, some mixture of competition and stable oligopoly, uh, competition restricted to a few producers in say auto and steel, which itself has now become much more competitive because of globalization. So I mean, the criticism of contemporary capitalism that it's not really competitive, I think is pretty false. I, mean, I think it was even false in the 50s and 60s. It's always been a pretty competitive system. And whatever's wrong with it has very little to do with lack of competition. Um, the information economy may exhibit a kind of serial monopoly structure. But again, this is not the problem that I want to point to. Um, so what are the dilemmas of the weightless economy? This is a summary of what I've said so far. It'll be almost impossible to sustain competition because of the positive feedbacks, the winner-take-all dynamics, and the very strong increasing returns to scale. That leads you to th those who get ahead stay ahead. Now, I don't believe in lock-in forever, but I believe there is a long dynamic of uh, winners staying winners for a long time. And they don't have to have the best product. They just have to be first with the most. Uh, because of this winner-take-all dynamic, we're going to generate a substantial amount of inequality, uh, as has been documented. I mean, winner-take-all uh, dynamics do generate inequality, whether it's uh, pop singers or uh, it, including dentists, uh, by the way. I'm not sure how that works. But uh, there is a study which suggests that uh, increasingly the rate of pay among dentists is diverging because some dentists are seen as you know, the best dentist, just like the best musician, and so on. But the, cri the critical thing is this. Private firms can't conform to the price equals marginal cost rule. Uh, now notice, this is not a question of externalities. They can't even do private, the, pri the price equals private marginal cost. So forget about social marginal cost, what we used to worry about because of externalities and so on. Uh, the, um, uh, and finally, property rights are both uh, difficult to enforce uh, and they're ambiguous. It's often hard to know whether one is contestable or not. Uh, so we then come to the question about, I mean, what I'm saying so far is the institutions which have worked tolerably well under the capitalist economy for the last 200 years or so are likely to work significantly less well in the future. That's not news to anybody here. 
Uh, the idea is, however, that the economy of the Pleistocene may be a place to look for some answers. And the reason uh, <clears throat> is that this is uh, from a uh, uh, rock painting in the Drakensberg Mountains, where I spent a lot of time camping, by the way. Uh, you can notice a couple of things. These, these things here are not owned by this guy here. He's just trying to kill one. And when he does, he's going to have to share it with all his friends. Because look at the size difference between the hunter and this. These are not kudus, but uh, uh, some other kind of animal. So um, uh, this is a hunter of the Hadza uh, people in uh, Tanzania with whom I've hunted. But for the Buddhist in the group, you should know I didn't catch anything. Uh, I, I, I would have been quite terrified if we had. But uh, I didn't expect to, because I knew, having studied the Hadza a fair amount, that this is the nature of the resources. Uh, they hunt these things, a kudu. This kudu probably has something like 160,000 edible calories in it. So that's, you know, forget turkey dinners and all that kind of stuff. It, and, and add this to no fridge, right? So there's basically, you've got this massive thing. Uh, this guy, if he goes out for every day in a month, uh, he would, in the course of a month, in expectations, get one animal. Uh, so the hit rate's about uh, 3%. Uh, and of course, um, the, um, uh, the result of this very large cache when you get it uh, is that it's widely shared. The, uh, if you look at data from other hunter-gatherer societies, it, looks, it seems like something like two-thirds of the caloric value is actually shared outside the nuclear family. Uh, when I was hunting with the Hadza, we did discover a very large uh, cache of honey, massive amounts of honey. I have no idea. I can't estimate calories uh, that well just by looking at a mass of stuff. But there was a very small band we, we were with, and uh, I, it must be 60 people showed up in the course of the day. How they found out about it, I don't know, but they were, we, we willingly shared all of this honey with everybody. It was gone. Uh, now, the culture of the foraging band is, I think, probably well known. Generosity and modesty towards uh, concerning one's success uh, are highly valued, and there are sharing norms, obviously, enforcing this two-thirds sharing rule, in some cases much more than two-thirds. Uh, you normally deprecate the stuff which you catch. You say it's not even big enough to, uh, to bother cooking. It's not even as big as a mouse, uh, even though it's a 20-kilo animal of some kind, and this is, uh, that's the way you're supposed to be. Um, the, um, uh, uh, Christopher Bohm, in a very important paper written in the early 80s, uh, described the, the culture of these societies in the following way. In these moral communities, group sanction emerged as the most powerful instrument for re regulation of individually assertive behaviors, particularly those which obviously disrupted cooperation or disturbed social equilibrium needed for group stability. Uh, so th now, this is done through mutual monitoring. Uh, through uh, multilateral punishment of or ostracism, sometimes quite severe, sometimes just ridicule. Um, and uh, we see this, by the way, in the experiments. We've done experiments in hunter-gatherer societies in many parts of the world. The sort of standard lab experiments that are done in economics and psych department labs, we've done in, in the field. Uh, and sure enough, as you'd expect, when they have a big resource to share, namely the pot of an ultimatum game or public goods game, they're extraordinarily generous in the sharing. Um, now, the important thing about this story, and the, and the reason why we get some purchase from it, uh, is that, of course, that system, which lasted, as I say, for hundreds, probably hundreds, or at least a hundred millennia, uh, was eventually displaced by uh, an entirely new system of property rights and decision making. Um, it was essentially re replaced by the domestication of crops. The critical thing about the domestication of crops and animals is this, not that it raised productivity. I think there's very good evidence that it lowered, initially lowered productivity, labor productivity. But it increased land productivity. It increased the productivity of land so that a small plot of land, small enough that you could fence, it was in your interest to fence it and defend it, uh, was productive enough to live on. So essentially then there developed the idea that you should define some resources as yours, uh, and it was worth investing your time in doing that. Uh, a, I think most people know that this domestication process long preceded the uh, development of states. So these property rights were not, in, were, were not enforced by states. They are enforced by some kind of mutual consent. Uh, uh, well, I'll, sh I'll show you a, an example of how they were enforced. Uh, this is a family in Mali. This is everything they own from a wonderful book called Material World, uh, which has lots of pages of people with everything they own. Uh, this probably is, by the way, everything they own, because almost certainly in Mali at the time this picture was taken, the land they're working probably was, com was communally owned. Uh, and uh, this is a horticultural family. I gather by its tools, they probably don't have draft animals. 
And they do have a radio, however. And of course, things developed a little bit along the way. And um, uh, we now have a lot of stuff uh, which uh, we own and which is thought to be the important things to, uh, um, to uh, ha have a good life. Now, so this first property rights revolution, uh, which I just described, uh, the development of possession-based individually held property rights, did contribute, as Adam Smith speculated, to the wealth of nations. But uh, if I'm right about the present, just as agriculture facilitated the unambiguous definition of these rights over things like cows and land and so on, uh, um, the, uh, the rise of the information economy, what I call the weightless economy, a term coined by Danny Kwa, by the way, the weightless economy has reversed the process. The most important resources, information, ideas, these are like the antelopes or the kudus or the giraffes that are hunted by the Hadza people. Uh, they're difficult to own. They're very risky to pursue. I don't mean risky in terms of danger. I mean that likelihood of getting one is small. And they're extraordinarily wasteful if they're not shared. Uh, so the idea here is we're returning to an uh, early Holocene, late Pleistocene economy. And the question then is this. Uh, You've all read, I think, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Mm -hmm. And so you all know that attempts were made to, uh, to domesticate all kinds of stuff, right? Zebras and this and that. Uh, in most cases, it didn't work. Uh, there were a few horses, cows, uh, for example, became more valuable when domesticated. So the question, and this is a question, and I expect uh, to learn from you, is um, consider a song or a software application. Is it, is it more like a kudu or is it like a cow? Kudus can't be domesticated, and cows can. Cows are very valuable when you tether them next to your house, and kudus just cause a lot of problems, apparently. They're like zebras and other things. Uh, Yohai loves the fact that I sometimes make the mistake of calling it a kudo, but it's actually a kudu. But the economy I'm talking about was based on kudos, that is, praise. It was also a reputation-based economy, so we're going we're to work on the title of this thing. Uh, so the question is, will the attempt to domesticate the modern-day kudu prove as costly and as, as ineffective. Uh, so here's Arrow again. Uh, and I, uh, it's very nice because Arrow is the guy who proved the fundamental uh, theorem of welfare economics. Uh, and he also said this much uh, more recently, information is a fugitive resource. Don't you love that? It runs away. I mean, it's almost like he anticipated my idea that, that, uh, that information is like these animals that the human pe beings used to uh, chase. Uh, information is a fugitive resource. We're just beginning to face the contradictions between systems of private property and of information acquisition and dissemination. We may see an increasing tension between legal relations and fundamental economic determinants. Uh, you're all well-read people. I hope you all can guess where that idea came from. There is a tension here. Well, the word contradiction should give you a hint, right? And not, and not Hegel, OK? Uh, the legal relations is what Marx called the social relations of production. Economic determinants, uh, information and so on, is what Marx called the forces of production, the knowledge and the technology which allow us to appropriate nature. Arrow is just repeating Marx here. Uh, uh, Arrow is a very well-read person. Of course, when I pointed this out to him, he looked at me with a, that whatever, if you can do a facial expression that says, duh, uh, that's, what he, <laughs> that's how he looked at me at the time. But here's my version of Arrow. There's the forager economy there. There's the economy of grain and steel there. And now we're back to the weightless economy uh, up on the edge there of the relational and uh, um, embodied. Now, um, well, if Arrow is correct, and obviously I think he is, how would we expect to see our econ economic institutions evolve under these new conditions? All right, now I have to ask your forgiveness because I think all of you know that studying how institutions change is one of the hardest problems in history and the social sciences. I think maybe the hardest problem. And that one of the reasons why it's so hard is it doesn't happen very often. And it happens in a very, what economists say, lumpy way. We don't have that many French revolutions. We don't have that many rise of feminism or end of foot binding in China or uh, Bolshevik revolution. There, you, know, you can count the well-documented cases on your hands or maybe your hands and your feet. Uh, so th we have, we're necessarily faced with a very small end problem of things which are pretty incommensurable. Modeling these dynamically is a project in which I'm engaged with many people at the Santa Fe Institute that is doing Markov process models of the process of institutional change. I'll give you a little picture of what, what one of those models looks like. Now, 
uh, I think it's, uh, I want to start with some obvious things. Probably institutional change happens because of a combination of within, within group or within country transitions. I mentioned the French Revolution. And between group competition, the defeat of hunter-gatherers by agriculturalists, for example. So there's some combination of, of within group uh, and between group activities that are part of this process. By the way, it's kind of nice because uh, Darwin, of course, had a, developed a very clear idea of how within group competition could be a source of change in human social structure, whereas Marx was the theorist primarily of these within group uh, social institutional revolutions. Now, uh, from a mathematical standpoint, there, there's a real problem in combining them, however, because you immediately see what you'll have. You, you, have, you have some chance things happening, uh, just events that are outside the model. Uh, and you have both individual selection, people deciding whether or not they're going to uh, adopt a new property rights system or a new technology. And you have the encroachment of one system on another. And these are all happening simultaneously. So I mean, technically, what you have is two selection processes, a group selection process, individual selection process, taking place at the same time. It's also likely that you have very large um, feedback effects, non-linearities technically in this process. And so it's almost impossible to solve these systems mathematically. But we can get some idea by simulating them. Uh, and one, uh, you know, one of the, process, one of the uh, attributes of these systems is, and it's, qu it's quite a nice one, and it seems right historically, is that they have many equilibria which means there are a lot of possibilities that things could have been differently. And uh, you know, obviously, if you want to study a process of what a biologist would call punctuated equilibrium, it's probably true that you're looking at a, what an economist would call an equilibrium selection process. You've got something going along, and then something changes the situation. So you get to some other thing, and then you have a long period of stasis there again. So it looks like, well, there's at least two equilibria in this system, and you just bump from one to the other somehow. Uh, um, now, um, what we do is, instead of looking at this as a system of equations which we can actually solve in ways which we have interpretable solutions, what we do is we simulate the process. We try to represent the process as well as we can. Uh, we, you know, we can do things like identifying where the equilibria are likely to be, uh, and then simulate it. And that's what I'm going to do, what I call running history backwards. Uh, um, the, um, so let me describe this model. Uh, which um, uh, is um, uh, here, um, we're going to basically have a model of how these groups and individuals interact. And then we're going to manipulate the parameters of the thing. We're going to play God with history, saying, how might it have turned out differently? For example, if groups had been smaller, if the competition between groups had been less, if people had updated their own individual traits in a different way. That's one of the wonderful things you can do with this. Actually. Don't try it at home unless you have a lot of coffee, because I find when I start, I can't go to sleep. I mean, I, I mean I'm not kidding. I've stayed up all night, because it's just so much fun doing these things. And if you want to do it yourself, you can go to my web page. I have a very user-friendly interface. And you can go there and take this particular model, and you can put in any parameters you want, and play God with history. And you can run it forwards or backwards or any way you want. Uh, so yeah, artificial history is on my web page. Uh, that's what I think we're doing. We're actually looking at. You know, we're essentially running hypothetical histories that all could have happened under the circumstances that we have outlined. Um, all right, this is going to be overly simple, but let's just assume we have three types of individuals. We have the bourgeois individual. The bourgeois term is from John Maynard Smith, the biologist. He called the bourgeois strategy something, if you're in possession of this item, then defend it. If not, uh, don't defend it. Uh, if, you're, um, if, you're a, a, if you're a sharer, uh, then you, you just share a good with whoever that you encounter. But of course, uh, if it's a bourgeois who's defending his uh, property, then the bourgeois keeps it because the bourgeois fights for it. The civic is the interesting character here. The civic is the quintessential forager who basically shares goods with people who are sharers. But if confronted with somebody who says, this kudu is mine, they call up all of their friends, their other civics, and they say, this guy thinks that kudu is his. What are we going to do about it? And they beat up on the guy. And of course, they're likely to succeed if there are a lot of civics in the group, and they're likely to fail if there are not many. So OK, you already see how you're going to get many equilibria, right? You can figure that out, right? Because if there are a lot of civics, the civics are going to win. If there are a lot of civics, they're going to lose. And so now we're going to get a bifurcation. That's, that's the basic idea here. Uh, now, uh, 
we know from Maynard Smith and um, a lot of work in biology that this B, that's the bourgeois strategy. This is evolutionarily stable, uh, which means technically it's an asymptotically uh, stable Nash uh, equilibrium because if, uh, as long as the property rights are well-defined, that's the key thing here, they have to be well-defined because otherwise you and I might disagree about who's in possession. And if we are, then one of us is going to fight for it. And uh, uh, then we're going to obviously exhaust a lot of resources in the fighting process. And if that ambiguity of the property right is sufficiently great, we'll wa waste enough resources in the litigation process or the fighting process so that some other strategy can beat our strategy of being bourgeois in the presence of ill-defined property rights. You already know where I'm going, right? That's the world we're going into in which we have ill-defined property rights, so maybe bourgeois is not going to work so well. Um, now, um, our agents um, are in firms. We have a bunch of firms that compete with each other. They compete frequently or infrequently, depending on the nature of markets and so on. Those who have wasted a lot in fighting of the type I just described, of course, will have lower profits or lower payoffs, and they will tend to go extinct. Uh, and be replaced, their market share taken up by firms that have somehow worked out things so that they're not fighting with each other. Um, and so we're looking for governance systems that avoid conflicts, basically. And we're not asking how just or unjust it is. We're just saying, if you can avoid conflict, you're going to win if you're a, a firm. Now, individual behavior is going to evolve in this system in the following way. Periodically, maybe at adolescence or maybe yearly, Individuals are paired with a cultural model who is drawn from, uh, the, uh, from one's group. Uh, it may be that it's drawn disproportionately from people who are in a majority in the group. Maybe it's drawn randomly. It doesn't really, I mean, it does matter. Uh, but uh, suppose the group that's numerically larger is more likely to supply the priest or the teachers or the uh, influential neighbors. Um, if the cultural model, my neighbor, my teacher, is of the same type as me, I'm bourgeois, he's bourgeois, I go home, I don't update. But if he's of a different type from me, then I look and see how well he did in the last period and how well I did. Or I sample the whole population and see how well, on the average, the bourgeois types and the civic types, if that's what I am, do. And uh, if the type that he is uh, is doing better than me, then I update to his type. Uh, groups compete, obviously. I've already said those with higher payoffs win. The losing groups, uh, they, um, they're not uh, eliminated. That's what happened in my talk yesterday, where we had actually the, re the genetic replacement of the losers. Here, we, this is a cultural model. The winning group provides the cultural model to the losing group. It's a kind of cultural imperialism among firms. That is essentially the people of the firm that loses look to the people of the firm that won as the likely cultural models. That is, they're paired with them. Uh, and they also lose some resources. The firm goes bankrupt, and they're out of work for a while, or you know whatever. Uh, now, as a result of this, the individuals who are in losing firms will have a strong tendency, not a necessity, it's all probabilistic, will have a strong tendency to update and become more like the winning firms. Uh, and that's how the property rights will, of course, emerge, because then the firms that win will tend to be replicated by the individuals in the losing firms. Uh, now, um, suppose, as is reasonable both in the Pleistocene and the Holocene, and the end of the Holocene right now, uh, there is some probability, some fraction of the time, a bourgeois player challenges the possessor. In other words, you, uh, I think that the thing you have a possession of is actually mine. Uh, and so mu, for mistake, uh, is the mistake probability. And then we can show uh, that um, uh, there will have, obviously, a cost associated with that uh, altercation. Um, uh, the civics incur costs of collectively punishing, but those costs are pretty low if there's a lot of them because they share the cost. Um, and as, I've, as is already obvious to you, if there are very few bourgeois, then the civics will do well and vice versa. Uh, now, so we have this, by the way, it looks like the same simplex, but it's not. It has the same construction. Here we have a society made up of only bourgeois players. A point in the middle here is these are the sharers. So this amount is the fraction who are sharers. This amount here is the fraction who are civics. You remember what the types are. These guys possess things and fight for them. These guys automatically share. And these guys share, and they try to punish people who don't share. Uh, now, uh, if property rights are well defined, this point here is uh, a stable equilibrium. Asymptotically stable just means self-correcting. So if you move away from that, you're going to come back. Uh, 
But what about all civic? Well, you can see all civic must be in equilibrium too, because all civics, you know, imagine a bourgeois guy coming into the all civic thing by migration or by mutation or whatever. Well, he's going to get hammered because he's going to he's going to uh, he's going to think he has some resources that are his, and uh, the civics will beat him up. Uh, but notice, all along this edge, you have combinations of civics and sharers, and they're behaviorally indistinguishable because if there are no bourgeois around, all they do is share. They're around sharing, right? So. Uh, Suppose you start out here, and then uh, you will then, and so, and you can move by migration or just random changing. Uh, you can what's called drift. You can drift along this edge, all you know, and anywhere along it. Uh, now you may think that this drift story is a little fanciful, but in a group of twenty, I mean, many firms are of size twenty, and many uh, groups in human society are of size twenty. Uh, if you have a reasonable fraction of people coming and going, or a reasonable error rate you'll have drift pretty fast along here. So if you start here, you're going to end up somewhere along there pretty quickly. Uh, I, I don't know if it's going to happen. You know, I don't know if you'll see this in the simulation that I'll run, but um, you, uh, you, it, you probably will. This is what are called uh, Lyapunov stable or neutrally stable equilibria. And by neutrally stable, it means that uh, there's no tendency to go back to where you came from, but there's no tendency to move away either. So it's just, uh, so if, if you're here and you move there, well then, until something else happens, you'll stay there as opposed to here, you move there, you come back. Uh, now, uh, Jung Kyu Choi, who's an uh, economist and uh, evolutionary biologist in Korea, and I uh, put together a model. Um, we have 25 firms, 20 individuals each. We have these uh, sharers, bourgeois, and uh, civics. We allowed property rights to, to range from entirely uninformative, that is mu is equal to one, they always make mistakes, uh, to uh, uh, entirely uh, clear. We have a cultural uh, learning process. And uh, let's see if, uh, now this is what you'll see if you go to my webpage, by the way, uh, and we're going to, Pick some values here. That is, uh, group war just means the firms go head to head. A level of conformism means the likelihood that somebody from the majority will be um, chosen as a, uh, uh, a model. Uh, and I'm going to run this for just a minute. It's going to boggle you. I'll stop it now. Uh, this is all bourgeois. That's that corner. That's all sharer. That's all civic. These are the bourgeois people up here. These are a little bit uninformative. These are, these are these bourgeois types, and these are the sharers and the punishers. Why do we have any sharers and punishers? Because of the randomness in the play. It's just the noise that's in the, in the system. Uh, but the crucial thing that you notice here is ambiguity of property rights is zero. Call that the economy of grain and steel. That's today or yesterday or 1950 or something. And, um, uh, you can let this thing go for more or less ever. Uh, uh, each of these dots is a group. Remember, we have 25 groups. Uh, and uh, stop it. It's make it go slower. By the way, that's slower. By the way, I, I promise you that's slower. Uh, and it, but this is interesting to notice. This looks like a very stable equilibrium here, but look how, how volatile things are. I mean, I just can't help mentioning that because in economists, we talk about it in economics. An equilibrium is that everything's frozen solid, right? Nothing moves. Uh, but if you look at these processes, you simulate them, there's a lot of volatility. Now, so let's stop that. Now, suppose that we have uh, ambiguity of property rights. Remember, this is the probability that an intruder, uh, a bourgeois who's an intruder, will think he's a possessor or act that way. So what's going to happen now? Uh, before I hit this, by, I'm not giving you something that's in my computer. right? You may think, oh, I worked this out, and I'm now showing you what I worked out you know, yesterday or something. No. This thing has never been seen before and will never be seen again, what you're now going to see. I don't mean that doesn't make it so special. But think of all the stochastic processes that are going on here. Who gets paired with whom, which group meets with whom, and so on. So this is an event that, you, that will never be repeated. And I say this because sometimes I run this, and things have happened that are entirely improbable to me. So I've had to explain to my students, well, that wasn't what I expected. Uh, now, that amount of ambiguity is still OK. Uh, and what's the cost of, uh, where, where's the cost of fighting open to the people? Uh, uh, the, um, it, it's not fighting. Or we, the cost we, of a disagreement. 
Um, the cost of the disagreement between me and you as a bourgeois yeah. is that uh, we, uh, when we fight, we lose. That is, one of us loses, and the losses are, better, are bigger than the gains. Uh, uh, but between groups, it's just profits. Uh, um, now, if we make property rights completely ambiguous, wait, why is it? Oh, I know. The groups, the groups are not, stop, stop, stop. It, see that? It says no group competition. I haven't turned on interfirm competition, so it couldn't ever get out of that place. Now we're going to run this. And notice what's happening now. The, the, the reason why I wasn't moving before is because I had turned off interfirm competition. Now what's going on now is you're moving between some equilibrium around here along that edge and some equilibrium down here, and you have these periodic revolutions and real big shifts in property rights uh, going in, um, from one of these things to the other. Now, what you'll notice is that instead of being here, you're somewhere in, in between there, and you're moving back and forth between these things. Now, if you look very slowly at this, I mean, I, the, my slow option is not as slow as I'd like. What happens is groups are like this. That's fine, because there are lots of uh, uh, civics. Imagine they drift down to here. And now imagine a bourgeois comes into the population. What happens? He takes off because there are not enough civics to punish him. And so then you go right over here. The advantage of this equilibrium is that it's asymptotically stable. It's an attractor. The advantage of this equilibrium is that it's efficient. It doesn't waste any resources in fighting. And so when the firms are competing with each other, you've got two different characteristics. One case, the thing is constantly returning to this inefficient solution. That, that works. And the other one wins intergroup conflicts, that is firm competition. Uh, all right, I'm going to put this away, but do, do please, uh, if you want, go and have a look at it. Uh, What's the URL? What? What's your website? Uh, I have no idea. Just, if, if you just Google, uh, you know, you'll find it. You'll, you'll find it. It's, it's Santa Fe. It's, it's, it's San, Bowl Santa Fe, I'll get it. Uh, this is a summary. Um, as we we alter the property rights ambiguity. This is the fraction of civics and shares. This is the fraction of bourgeois. Each point here is the average of 20 runs of 10,000, quote, generations. A generation is a period in which firms compete once. So it could be you know, a market period of some kind. So each point was generated by this. By the way, the error bars are very small. Uh, that is, if you, know, if you just do the same there, you always get more or less the same result. Uh, and um, so. Uh, now, I don't think this is the right way to understand the future as history, because what I have done, notice, is I have myself shifted this ambiguity. I just ranged it across here and said, well, what would happen? But whether or not the ambiguity of property rights is going to actually happen depends on two things. One is the evolution of technologies themselves, and the other is the evolution of the legal structure. This is not just something which is, is uh, preordained, it's something which that's what this, uh, this center is all about, uh, trying to figure out a way, ways of handling these things in uh, different manners. Now, um, this is, uh, so when you think about this future process, uh, I think it's useful to have a, a clear idea about what, what, what works for what. Uh, comparative advantage of different kinds of institutions. Markets allocate well under the conditions of the fundamental theorem. States are good at coercing, uh, and uh, that is, they have superior enforcement powers, obviously. Communities, uh, like the communities I described in the Pleistocene, but also like open source software communities and neighborhood communities and so on, they're particularly good at handling the ambiguity in property rights among neighbors, for example, about sound uh, uh, incursions and so on. But they tend to fail, communities do, when inequalities among members of the communities are very large, either hierarchical structures or big re inequalities of reward, tend to interrupt and make it difficult uh, cooperation in small groups. We know this from experiments. Uh, now, the problem of the economy into which we're entering is the following. Uh, the um, uh, information, the, the weightless economy in general, uh, creates both substantial ambiguity and contestability of property rights and a lot of inequality. If it did one or the other, there'd be a solution. A lot of inequality, fine, it could be handled by markets and states. Or uh, if you have uh, a lot of ambiguity of property rights and not a lot of inequality, then these communitarian or 
so on, face-to-face -face kind of things might work. Both is going to be tough. And I think the countries that are most unequal will be, will be most penalized in devising solutions for this. Uh, the, um, uh, now, I said at the beginning, and I'll, I want to say this before I close, uh, the, um, of course, this, I mean, this hunter-gatherer idea is, uh, is, a, is a, a kind of catchy idea, but I don't mean it uh, literally. This is, um, Hayek says, look, the problem has to do with how information is processed and who has the information. And this is a very, very insightful statement that he makes. Um, uh, which of these systems, central planning or the market, is more efficient depends on whether we're more likely to succeed in putting at the disposal of a single central authority, the planner, all of the knowledge which ought to be used, but which is initially dispersed among the many different individuals, or in conveying to the individual such additional information as they need in order to enable them to fit their plans in with the plans of others. Now, what is this additional information he's talking about? He's talking about prices. Prices are information. He's saying, how can a society alter the prices that are facing individuals so that the private citizens will act in ways which are essentially will implement, uh, he wouldn't say a Pareto a superior outcome because he wouldn't use that language, but he means a superior outcome of some kind. So he's saying, can you adjust the prices so that you get the right outcome, or can you concentrate the information uh, at the uh, center? Uh, that's the right answer, but of course now we have a third player uh, made famous uh, because of Lynn Ostrom's new uh, recent Nobel Prize, that which we have not just markets and states, we have market states and communities, and they have particular abilities to solve these problems. Now, it's interesting that um, this, was, this was the beginning of a successful counterattack by the critics of central planning, Hayek being among them, who had lost the first round and the major round of this debate in the 30s about central planning in the market. The left won that debate for paradoxical reasons that the assumptions of neoclassical economics, namely that everybody has the same information and it's complete, were of course ideal for the socialist position because if everybody has the same information then the planner has it too and this problem that Hayek is talking about doesn't come up. Hayek was scratching his head, I'm sure, throughout these years because he, di he didn't look very good in the 30s but he looked brilliant. This is a paper in the American, oh, this is in the American Economic Review. Please read it. It's great. Uh, uh, people, socialists like Lange and Dobb and so on, speculated, you know, 50 years ago, that computers would solve this problem uh, for, um, uh, in alter the balance between markets and central authorities. But what, what I want to ask is, taking what Hayek says is correct, extending it to communities, how does the uh, cost, the very reduced cost of communicating over a large scale, affect the balance that we should have between communities and states and, um, uh, and markets? Uh, these are, um, I want, the uh, successful institutions have to do a couple of things. Uh, just to be clear, you have to support high level of information creation. It's not just that things should be available at their marginal cost, but they should, they should happen, right? They should come into existence. So we need to have the information being made available at its marginal cost, but we also need to have incentives for uh, uh, getting the stuff produced in the first place. Now that problem is exactly the question which is asked of hunter-gatherer societies. Why do the hunters hunt if they have to give it all away? They do hunt. Uh, the good hunters actually hunt more than the bad hunters. And uh, in some societies, they give it all away. Among the Aceh in Paraguay, for example, they give away everything. They, are, they and their immediate family are not allowed a scrap of whatever it is that they catch. Uh, so, and they do. And they easily, by the way, could, while they're hunting, instead of hunting, they could take some fruit or some tubers, which they wouldn't have to share at all. Uh, now, I think that kind of behavior describes a lot of people in this room. Uh, and I think we would be uh, very mistaken if we didn't think that that's part of the process of solving this problem. That is, there are reputational gains, there's pleasurable activities involved in creating this stuff, but I don't think that, I mean, I don't think that solves the problem, but we shouldn't rule it out either. Uh, the, uh, now, obviously, this is a point. If, if, if things like what Ostrom calls communities are part of the story, inequality will be a problem. So um, I love the smile on his face. Uh, these, are, uh, some guys I, <laughs> these are some guys I hunted with in Tanzania. Uh, and uh, I, this, I guess, is just a long plea that um, we have a lot to learn. Uh, and uh, that's my wife learning how to hunt uh, with the uh, Hadza. And that's a very small part of my research team, uh, Jun Kyu Choi, uh, Rajiv Sethi, and uh, Suresh Naidu. Um, and uh, this is the Santa Fe Institute and the University of Siena. Thank you very much.
Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes, and uh, I would welcome comments um, or any observations or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so markets and states are scalable, and I guess one of the questions here is, what do we know about the scalability of, of communities? As, as long, it seems like dealing with this ambiguity is easier in smaller groups and, and grows increasingly complex as things get bigger. Is, have you thought about that? And I know people in this room have thought about it. <laughs> How many people work on Wikipedia, do you think? Is that, is that an example? Is that a partial answer to your question? Uh, I don't know. I, I, perhaps, perhaps. I mean, the ambiguity in Wikipedia occurs within small groups, not across wide scales. So Wikipedia scales nicely in that sense yeah. that it's, it's hierarchical and it, it can be broken down in that way. But I don't know. I haven't thought about this before. So. Well, you know, I, what I notice is that, um, well, I, I'd like to hear what other people think about this. Obviously, in, in putting Hayek up and mentioning Dobb and uh, Langa's talk about how maybe the information technology will change the mix that we should be pursuing between markets and states, I want to extend that to communities. The, the obvious problem with the hunter-gatherer situation is it can't take advantage of economies of scale and economies of diversity. Hunter-gatherer groups were, you know, relatively small number of people, much larger than most people think, but nonetheless small. So obviously what we need is something which combines the ability to do, remember Christopher Bohm's comment, the mutual monitoring and the sort of moral sanction. We have to combine that with large numbers. Whether that can be done in non-face-to-face -face situations, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, and I think, you know, we're probably on, on the way to finding out in some, you know, like uh, reputational things on uh, eBay and that kind of thing. Yeah. Your question is for me, but to go to your comment, a worldwide common pool resource that we're going to have to deal with, that we've, that we've dealt with on one level, uh, somewhat successfully, and we'll have to deal, have to figure out if, uh, to deal with more successfully, is the atmosphere. And the Montreal Protocol is a worldwide community of nations and, and businesses, um, which has so far successfully kept the stratospheric ozone you know, alive or ex in existence. Um, that idea of common pool resources, which is which is Elena uh, Alstom, I, I wish you would talk about that a little bit more. And also, uh, you went over and you <coughs> frogged over network economies, but I'm remembering uh, what Kevin Kelly has written about the fax and the fax machine and, and its development and how the more members you have in a network, the more uh, useful the network becomes. So, so those two things, common for resources, Lynn Ostrom, Kevin Kelly, and, and the, the increasing advantage to larger networks. Well, you know, the, the value of a network, suppose the value of the network to me is uh, the uh, number of other people in the network. So the total value of the network is n times n minus 1, right? There are n members in the network to which it's worth n minus 1. You know, or some scalar of that, right? So obviously, that's a huge increasing returns to scale. I can't think of any production function in technology which have, would have that almost quadratic form, right? Uh, and so, yeah, there's, there's huge economies of scale. And the, that, that's the story of the facts, but it's also the story of the growing domination of the world by English language and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, that's where you get the winner take all from. Uh, and also, basically, a lot of things that ought to happen don't necessarily happen because of this, you know, you can't get in. Uh, now, I don't know, I mean, I, I think that um, uh, Ostrom's great uh, contribution was to take some insights of uh, Ronald Coase that, oh, guess what, the economy is just not exchanges, the economy is not only exchanges, but also uh, non-market interactions that take place within organizations that are non-market, in Coase's case, firms, uh, and she extended that beyond firms to include such things as uh, communities. Uh, now, she was also in advance over Mansur Olson because Mansur Olson's great contribution was to show the difficulty of collective action among self-interested individuals. And she also then, of course, challenged that by saying, well, look, we observe these communities and they somehow managed to maintain, maintain mountain pastures or fisheries and so on over hundreds, in some cases, probably thousands of years, uh, and thereby essentially uh, extending Coase and challenging Olson.
Uh, now, I think that's her contribution. What her application to information technology, the knowledge-based economy is, well, that's in a way what this talk is about. Uh, but I, uh, I really don't know how you directly apply it because, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, what are the motivations. Are the motivations for software developers similar to the motivations for hunters? Uh, reputational, partly. Um, uh, partly also it's fun. There's some sense of agency or, uh, you know, craft. Well, I think, you know, we could ask ourselves. I mean, I don't hunt, but I do uh, create knowledge. And uh, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So maybe, they all, maybe, maybe people do that for fun. Uh, obviously, they don't do it without resources. So that's a... Um, but how this applies to uh, uh, climate change um, is, of course, a big challenge, because what that suggests is creating communities across extremely wide areas, mm -hmm. uh, which are uh, interrupted by national boundaries, uh, which are associated with national prejudices and worse. Yeah. I'm not um, sure what, what you mean by community and whether and how broadly it applies to what how people connect on the net. So um, just, what do you mean by community? Uh, I mean relations among people that are not market and they're not mediated by the state. So uh, the broadest, any... What we're doing right now. Yeah. But doesn't... Your relationship with your kids, uh, et cetera, right? It's, so I mean, which covers you know, all of common... I mean, you know, it's, it's a little connection. bit, you know, what is it? What is the article in the Constitution, you know, uh, things not governed by, yeah, et cetera, uh, or, the, or the managerial rights clause in a labor contract. I mean, I'm saying, basically, it's everything that isn't the subject of your standard public economics uh, textbook, which has markets and states in it, right? So I, I'm sorry to uh, ask what is essentially a really, you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> the, if that's going to be a, a, uh, an entity in your, in your model or your thinking, then that assumes that insofar as it plays a role, that there's a set of common features to it that make it useful to use. As, so states coerce, right? That's yeah. one of the things that we can say about states. They have coercive power. Um, what are the set of assumptions about what all possible human connections are that enable communities to be a useful factor in a model or in your thinking? Uh, I, I understand your question, and I, uh, it's a valuable question. I've learned when starting uh, on a, a big new project that defining terms very carefully at the beginning is sometimes not a good idea because you close down some possibilities that the ambiguity might open up. That's not an excuse for not answering your question, <laughs> but it does explain why it is that I answered your question in such a broad way. Now, my, uh, the, the answer which I would now give is this. I don't say that all the things which I would call in that omnibus category have similar characteristics. Of course, they do have some of the nots, the negatives, right? Uh, but when I talk about communities, I point to particular communities. Uh, and, you know, when, when I define a dog, uh, I don't actually give a dog definition. I say, well, it's like that and like that, right? That's not entirely adequate for a biologist. Uh, but it's good enough as long as you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about hunter-gatherer groups who are deciding how to hunt and how to share the thing. And I'm talking about people who are parts of research teams that are trying to create knowledge, or people who are part of some musical organization that are putting on shows and so on. Those are the kinds of things I'm talking about. Now, it's pretty clear what they have in common. There is a public thing which they create, and they have to figure out some way of sharing the benefits of that, and they have to figure out a division of labor of who's going to do it. Uh, and they're not doing this primarily through uh, enforceable contracts, although there may be self-interested mechanisms generating the incentives for which people do this stuff. So now I agree that's not a satisfactory answer, but it's as far as I want to go because I don't know where this whole research project is leading. And uh, Albert Hirsch Hirschman once wrote a wonderful paper, you should read it, called Against Parsimony. Uh, and what he said is if you're just starting out, par parsimony can be your enemy. Uh, people who do mathematical economics, like myself, are basically guilty of parsimonious reasoning, whereby the simpler the model, the better. And of course, we don't realize that often we don't really understand what we're doing. And we've got a nice, simple model. And once we're happy with it, we're going to preclude thinking about other stuff. Uh, uh, Albert Hirschman. Uh, he also wrote Exit, Loyalty, and Voice, a book you may have heard. Yeah. Uh, let me step back even one step before David. Uh, it's a lot to digest, as you say. And I've visited 
of the Santa Fe Institute and know that there usually is either a self-taught or a psychologist around. And one of the things I was wondering, if you have included this as a variable, which is the malleability of the human psyche. And I was very interested in some of the assumptions you made, because you can look at, I won't go over developmental theory, but very often a child's second, third, fourth word is mine. And the reason it is mine is that the first job of the child is to differentiate herself from the environment, because when a child is born, it doesn't know it's not part of the environment around it. And how does it come to recognize that it's not the mother's breast or whatever around it? And I think your theory would change a bit if you began to understand, is that a universal? Is that change? No, it's not. It's, it's, yeah. I can answer that right away. That's but we not. don't, but then you're saying the human psyche the development of the infant does not have to go through a series of stages that leads it to understand it's not part of its mother. And oh, therefore, that it does, but I thought you meant that mind, meaning the property in inanimate objects. Yeah, that mind then becomes translated to a tiny child into what's me and what's next door. Oh, I, I agree with the me and mom, but I don't agree with the me and toy. But I think that would be very, so interesting to understand oh, when it doesn't work. And but that's if, it doesn't, if it doesn't work, yeah. if, if it doesn't mean anything to claim a physical object as your own, it'd be very unlikely that kids would say that. Uh, now, um, and, and in, by the way, I'm not making this up. I mean, people have studied socialization among hunter-gatherers, right? right. Uh, now, they spend a whole lot of time uh, teaching people to share and do all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, but I, the idea is somehow that private property is... Um, it, it would be very rare. I mean, very. I mean, it would have had to have happened very quickly. Private property, in the sense that we understand it, is just I mean, incredibly recent. You know, and you, there are some. You know, lactose tolerance probably uh, evolved, and I mean, certainly evolved in a short period of time. And it could be that a, a genetic predisposition towards pri private property could also have done the same thing. But there's no evidence for that, no. and it would be remarkable if it were true. I'm not that is genetic, but more as developmental. I don't know, it's just a lovely variable to, in one of those endless mm -hmm. luncheons at the Santa Fe Institute, to hear some of the psychologists. Okay, now let me answer them. more, more um, constructively. Uh, malleability of the human psyche in this model is when a person changes from being, maybe an adolescence or whatever, from being a sharer to a civic. Uh, I'm tired of giving away my stuff. I want to fight with the other guys if somebody tries to take it away. Now, I'm not describing that process, and I'm not describing it as developmental, but I'm, but I'm, that, you know, that's a, technically, it's a replicator equation in which somebody, when confronted with a whole series of experiences, then becomes something else. Now, when I say becomes something else, I use strategies as shorthand for a personality which would be motivated to act that way. So that's the connection between what you said and what I said. That is, a civic is a person who gets really angry when somebody grabs. It's visceral with them. So they don't decide on this strategy, they just get real angry and they carry it out. So I'm using the, you know, I, I use strategies, I mean, uh, as shorthand, I mean, it's very irritating when game theorists do this, I use them as shorthand for things that people do without ever saying they have to be motivated to do them that way and that, that requires a certain upbringing and set of experiences. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, so you talked a lot about the different modeling and Simulations for different the, the nice static thing, um, but then the, the, top, the title of your talk is Pudonomics, and this really nice question of whether or not you know proper different types of property rights are going to end up with a, you know, some can be domesticated more easily than others. Um, do you do you think to be able to actually drill down sort of at a micro level in your agent-based modeling to, to come up with predictions as to what types of where, where, which types of um, property rights models might be more evolutionary stable? Uh, yes, I think that should be the objective. Based models are the right way to do that. Because I think standard economic and legal uh, uh, ways of ex exploring how certain kinds of contracts and incentives uh, work uh, are perfectly adequate to that task. I mean, we don't, I don't think we have a gap in our theoretical apparatus for addressing this question. We just haven't done it yet. 
Now, if there is a gap, it's that many economists approaching this will assume that everybody is self-interested. And so, therefore, you can't draw upon other kinds of motivations, like a concern for others or a concern for your craft or intrinsic motivations and so on. But that's changing very rapidly in economics. So setting aside that as a, as a problem, it seems to me we have the equipment. We just haven't done the work. Uh, and you know that I shouldn't say we just haven't done the work. The people in this room are doing that and trying to figure that out all the time. And I expect to, uh, as the years go on, to learn from you practical you know, solutions to how these problems might work. I mean, obviously, some things are going to turn out more like cows, and some things will turn out more like kudus. Uh, and uh, you know, you can, I can say in general what I think those characteristics would be, and it has a lot to do with the differences between first copy costs and marginal costs. And you, know, you can sort of look at the origin of the problem and then say, oh, this one is going to be endemically a problem that's going to be very hard to solve by domestication. Uh, but that's, you know, notice how I'm reasoning very abstractly here. I'm re reasoning from these principles about what the problem is to a sort of a typology of the kinds of things that are going to be hard to solve and not. And that could be just wrong because, you know, we could have changes in technology and uh, obviously, obviously changes in legal structure which would change this. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. There's a lot of wrangling about what the government's role ought to be in well, health care and other things. If your if your economy has some things that are like kudus and others that are like cows, it doesn't it calls for a drastically different role by the government. I mean, I assume that some of your work will lead to recommendations for for how to you know how to level the playing field or whatever you want to call it. You know, what role regulation and a government should have. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that it's much early to say, but it's a very good question, and it's one which I think has to be answered. So let me tell you what I now think about that. Uh, um, this, this, um, uh, I don't think there is, uh, as far as where this leads in terms of m uh, more or less government, uh, I don't think there's any conclusion about that at all. I, it clearly leads to different kinds of government interventions. Uh, for example, if you're entering an area in which you're like kudu hunters, namely software engineers or songwriters, uh, then you need an insurance policy. Uh, now, the kudu hunters got it through the re reciprocal relations among all the kudu hunters, uh, and we probably need it in some other way, or we're going we're gonna, to uh, reduce the amount of innovation that we get. So it would seem that there's a very strong argument for a much larger role of the state in insurance uh, for things we now wouldn't even think of insuring for uh, or, or against. And I think that can be done in ways which are... Uh, what are called technically incentive compatible, that is, it can't be exploited by people and so on. Uh, so there could be a larger role in, in, the, in, those, uh, uh, in those areas. Uh, I think another important thing is the following. I think a lot of problems we're dealing with now, there, there's a tendency among policymakers and economists, but also stemming from uh, uh, a whole history of constitutional thinking going back to Hobbes and even earlier to Machiavelli, which says, we don't really care about the preferences here. You give me any kind of preferences, selfish, venal, I don't care. I can design a set of property rights and a set of incentives such that this people, how, how so, however so selfish they are, uh, will implement an outcome which is a good outcome. Then this is a sort of standard view in implementation theory and mechanism design in economics. Uh, it's what I call Machiavelli's mistake. Uh, Machiavelli said everybody's wicked, uh, hunger makes them industrious, laws make them good. Uh, that's in the discourses, not in his famous book. Uh, and uh, that, I mean, th that view has been a tremendously influential view about economic policy making. And I think it's right in lots and lots of areas. But there's some big problems in which, it's, in which that's not going to solve. You know, like, I mean, you mentioned global warming. Uh, I think the handling of information and so on. I don't think you're ever going to design a set of incentives which would succeed in allocating those resources correctly unless one had an extraordinarily intrusive state violating all kinds of notions of pro uh, privacy which we wouldn't want to accept on liberal grounds. Uh, so I think that the, you know, a very important part of this is not to fundamentally change the, the approach to policy making or implementation theory, but to take very seriously that when you're designing incentives, you have to take account of the fact that some of the reasons why people are already doing the right thing is that they have their own motivations for doing that. And then the final point, which I've documented in a series of recent papers, one of which you'll find in science, that if you, if you introduce monetary incentives for people to do things, you may get worse results rather than better results. That is, this is a so-called crowding out phenomenon. 
So this fundamentally changes how you think about this incentive problem because if you didn't have social preferences and ethical uh, uh, motivations, there wouldn't be a problem of crowding out because there's nothing to crowd out. But once you recognize that the solution to problems is always some combination of these incentives designed by economists and uh, constitutional writers and so on, on the one hand, and these moral incentives that a substantial fraction of humans have in some situations, if that's the combination, then you have to be extremely aware of the fact that those two things are not technically separable. That is, intervening in one of these things can affect the effect of the other thing. Uh, and it often happens in deleterious ways. And there's, there's very strong evidence that that's happening. Notice I'm not answering your question because I don't know how you could use that information in order to actually design policies better. But I can assure you that I'll have something to say about that by next by January because I'm giving a series of lectures called Machiavelli's Mistake. And I've already promised that the last lecture is about the public policy implications of taking seriously that this paradigm is fundamentally wrong because it ignores the fact that some problems are solved not solely by material incentives but by a combination of people's pre-commitments to do the right thing and the incentives. I think we have to end, because it's traditional to end uh, already three minutes ago. Thank you very much for your comments. I look forward to being in touch with you. Thank you. <laughs>